Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. How are you, dude? Of the Meaningful People podcast. Right? We're, we're back here um, with an episode with Dr. Akiva Perlman. It only took us seven minutes to Google before to see if he's actually a doctor. Because, you know, some therapists are like, oh, doctor. <laughs> like, no, I'm not a doctor. But he is a doctor. Dr. Akiva Perlman. The doctor of Zen. Yeah. He's so he's a Zen doctor. He's like the therapist for therapists. He's so Halig. Wow. Mo, guys, Momo is struggling right now. Get he had, a, oh, he, he, had a, he had a root canal today, and he was he hasn't slept in like days. Just be real with the audience. I slept in. A, I've slept. It's not the lack of sleep. It's it's the straight from the airport to Doctor Jonathan Yoni Schwartz. So shout Halig. out, shout out, Jonathan. Big shout out to Rabioni. He's so Halig. He 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 told me to come straight from the airport, and he's helping me out. I'm dealing with some real canal issues right now. Oh man. It, the struggle is real, people. The, the root canal? The, the root canal, yeah. Root, oh, that canal, they say, is pretty bad. We just, guys, we just recorded an episode that's going to come out, I don't know, in a few weeks. But, I, like, a standing ovation, everyone, even if you're driving, pull over for a Momo <laughs> Bauman. He just, he literally had a root canal. Uh, he was on a flight. He had a flight the other day. just got feeling back in my in my mouth. Like, he I'm was numb. We were words. nervous if he's going to be numb. Then how that would have been hysterical. If you were numb, it would have been funny. I'm I'm self conscious that this thing is in the shop, but I don't care because life isn't perfect. Okay, it's there. Big deal. It's perfectly imperfect. Perfectly imperfect. For everyone listening, you don't don't worry. It's all good. Anyways, this was such an awesome awesome episode. Therapy. Yes. Therapy. Yes. Big Indian. Yes. Just systematically destigmatizing it. It's such a it's such an important resource. It's available to us in the from community, and Dr. Akiva Perlman is doing such groundbreaking work. By just spreading it to the masses, empowering communities, Hasidisha communities, Litvisha communities, just really helping therapy become available to anyone, anywhere. It's amazing. And this episode would not be possible without our friends. From Bridge Credit Solutions. All hobbled and all. Momo Bauman still pulls through with the big Bridge Credit Solutions <laughs> because... It's what gets me through. Yeah. Bridge Credit Solutions. Guess what? You might need therapy if your credit is out of whack. <laughs> you like that plug there? Yeah. You might need therapy if your credit is out of whack. So go ahead and reach out to the people who can make magic happen and fix your credit. That is Bridge Credit Solutions. Hit the link in the description or in the show notes. You'll send a message to an awesome little fellow at or big fellow at Bridge Credit Solutions and they'll say, hey, let's help you fix your credit. It gets started right Because we here. are. Bridge I want to credit. Do it. Oh, you want to do it? Can I do it? Get in there. Bridge yeah. credit solutions. It's pretty much the same thing. But you have a lot more base. <laughs> I don't know how. Also, a big shout out to our friends at Hayenu. Guys, the free trial is still existing. Those those pamphlets full of Rambam, Chumash, Tehillim, Tanya. You were just on a on a trip somewhere. Yeah. You had your Hayenu booklet with you. How was that? It was really Halig. It's it's so well formatted. It's so easy. It's so available. It's there on the app. It's there on the on the pamphlet. I'm a fan of the pamphlet personally. Yeah, I like. You're an old do, soul. I am an old soul. Yeah. I'm old school. We do so much on our phone. You're probably doing this right now yeah. on your phone, but maybe well, you just want to calculate have, like, What's that? It's not on their calculator. Like this is a <laughs> podcast. Where yeah, we're supposed to listen to it on no, on their toaster? laptop computer. Oh. I don't know. That, I don't know. I don't, I, if you're listening to this on your computer right now, God bless you and your family. You send us an email because wow. Oh, maybe you're watching it on YouTube. Okay, yeah, I guess that's different. Or yeah. maybe you're watching it on TheMeaningfulMinute.org. Maybe, maybe. Whether you're watching it there or here or everywhere, Chayenu <laughs> is available in pamphlet form, and it's. I just I feel like I'm tapping into my roots, my roots canal oh, with Chayenu. Wow. How are you doing? So I head to Chayenu.org forward slash trial because they have a free trial going right now. You can sign up for free. Get this booklet sent to you. Ain't nothing like it. Enjoy this episode, everyone. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. You, you, you're not the first therapist in your family. No, not even close. You're, you got a lot, a lot of mental health genes. Well, I think when you're raised, you're raised in an environment that's like very conscientious about the environment and culture and suffering humanity which is the home i grew up in right i, I grew up in um are we starting 
<laughs> we started. We started? Yeah, now okay. he loves the incognito start. Oh, I got you. The I like kickoff. the kickoff. <laughs> like, we're already in the middle of I the like episode. I like it. I know. Sure. <laughs> I didn't know, but okay, we're here. You know those big, you know those big planes, mm-hmm. and you're just like, did we, did we lift off? You know, you just did it today, like. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're in this. Yeah, we're in it. <laughs> Wonderful. It's good to be here. Thanks <laughs> Welcome. For having me. Yeah. The uh, all the way from Staten Island, by the way. Staten Island. No, you're not from Staten Island. No, Hillcrest, Queens. What? Oh. Yeah, there are some other Perlmans with red hair. No, I, I made in a mistake. Staten you know what's funny? I my uh, my very niche. My sister in law's grandmother lives in like Hillcrest. Mm-hmm. And she lives next to Dina, the shul. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the famous Dina, right? Everyone knows Dina from Hillcrest. From Hillcrest, which is also very niche. How many people live in Hillcrest? Not everyone in this room knows Dina from Hillcrest. You don't? You have to know <laughs> Dina from Hillcrest. Dina from Hillcrest, like a, it sounds like it's like a Mike Francesa call in. Like, <laughs> Dina from Hillcrest, go on. Uh, first time call, a long time listener. And she'd have so much to say. Right. Every time I walk into shul. I think this is the part where you tell us what Dina from Hillcrest is. Well, Dina is. <laughs> this is so not what he expected to <laughs> be talking about There's tonight. a Stiebel. There's a Stiebel in Dina. In, in Hillcrest, a, a, a Hasidic steeple, actually, Reb, Reb Moshe Weinberger grew up in that shul. Mm. There's a plaque. What? Really? Uh, yeah, in that shul with Dina. Dina's, I imagine it was Dina's father when Reb Moshe Weinberger was there. Wow. Um, he grew up, he davened there most of his life as a child. That's wow. crazy. That's like, you know, that's like an athlete leaving his like random hometown. <laughs> it comes back, you know, the burger joint is like all decked out for him. <laughs> it's really wild. There's a plaque right in front. I think it's in something related to his father. Um, and he would speak about like what took place in that shul. At this point, Hillcrest is really a community that is, um, again, a lot. Of, it was it was very popular. Let's say twenty twenty five years ago. Um, my wife and I we really like diversity. It is something that we appreciate. So we were looking for a place that was like included a great deal of many people, uh, and that's what it did. And raising our kids there was just a beautiful place. We're actually on our way out. We're going to be moving to uh, West Hempstead shortly. Whoa, welcome. Yeah. Is that where you live? No, but that's oh, like sort enough. of here. It's close enough. No? Yeah. Um, but, it, but it was such a beautiful place to, like, to, you know, to raise our kids. Um, every, all kids from different schools, different ages, hanging out with one another. And I think that's the beauty of a small community. Right. Um, but every once in a while, it gets a little bit too small, so you begin to move on. But so Dina, Dina's brother was the Rav of the Shul, unfortunately got sick. So it's been many years since he's been there. So there's no rub. It's just a shtiebel and with a small minion. But Dina's basically like the the focus of the place. You walk in, she always has what to say. Oh, yeah. it's, it's usually encouraging or discouraging, but it's always with a lot of love. Mm-hmm. So you got to appreciate it, you know. So tell us a little bit about your family, about your upbringing. You know, you're, like we mentioned, we like alluded to the fact that you're not the only therapist in your family. And right. that's like your immediate family and also your... Now yeah. fam, I don't know. They're both immediate, I guess. Yeah, it's all immediate now, but it wasn't always. Right. I, I, it, it really started with my mother. My mother, I grew up in a, a single family household. My mother really raised um, all of us, really primarily by herself. Um, and she became a therapist, I think, when I was a little bit older. Um, uh, I wasn't yet a teenager, but she wasn't always a therapist. She became a therapist. Um, and it was a, my home was a home that was filled with strangers coming and going. I think today you'd look at it today and say, like, we were like a little bit of an hour place, a mini hour place, and that was our family. That was our environment. Um, there was a strong language about conscientiousness of others and people and our role in the world and trying to bring love and healing and connection. And my mother was really just at the forefront of all of that. And the fact that I'm one of eight, Kanai Nahara, wow. and fi- the bottom five are all therapists. Um, and the top three are, they're not officially therapists, but they're, they're somewhat therapists. They're, they're healers. They're bringing mm. some love and connection into the world through lecturing or other, other forms of, of, of just connection with others. What a Thanksgiving dinner, huh? <laughs> I think that's the, that's like the most obvious question you get is like <laughs> what does that what does that look like? Yeah, what is and a Shabbos? The, like? <laughs> and the truth is, a Shabbos table. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the DSM, yeah, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. That's like what therapists use to diagnose, you know, people to to give them a classification. Where do they belong? And it was fairly, you know, common for us to analyze one another and and really? give each other titles. Like we really grew up. I grew up in an environment where therapy was center stage. Um, I think that what I did, my wife is a, is a psychologist, and I think we were very aware of the fact that that's how I grew up, and I didn't appreciate it very much because it felt like it was just it was too much. Um, you, you just 
as a child, you just want to be right. as opposed to like needing to defend yourself. Like, oh, you're, you're passive aggressive. And first you need to figure out what passive aggressive is. <laughs> and then you need to like defend whether or not you're passive aggressive. And that was typical. It was like a normal thing. Um, but there was a lot of love, a lot of care. Um, and also a lot of struggle, you know, when you grow up in an environment like that. And I think it actually is what brought us to where we are today. You know, I, and I know I'm here. I'm the person in the room right now. But there's a large part of me that always feels that I'm here with my family. Like we are, we're here on a journey. We all do different things. Um, we're all operating in different areas. Um, but we, we do everything we can to, to bring a voice of, of just conscientiousness and love and acceptance into the world. And I think that's a pervasive theme and that really ultimately stems from my mother. No question. That's beautiful. That's so how many therapists are in your family? So the, the, again, I'm one of eight. The bottom five bottom are five. all therapists. I have two older brothers. I have Ellie who lives out in uh, Tom's River. He is a private practice. My brother, Sonny, which I think many, many of you might be familiar with. He runs our place, our village in Muncie, like a recovery center there. Um, and then myself, so I always like, I grew up behind these guys, uh, some of my heroes. And then, uh, my younger sister, Sarah, she's a psychologist. She works at YU, um, as an assistant Dean. And my youngest brother is also a social worker. And my wife is a psychologist. Uh, more recently, we've actually been speaking together a lot, which has been a lot of fun. It's like a whole new hmm. area of exploration for us. So what do you think about us? Like, could you tie us up, like, real quickly? <laughs> I think you guys are a cute couple. Yeah. No oh, question. thank you. Yeah. There's, like, there's some nice like, vibes. If you look at me right now, could you tell if I'm nervous or not? No. No. You, you don't really... I think there's these misconceptions about what a therapist is and what you're capable of doing. Let's dive and, into right, that. It's not, it's not really mind reading and, like... Yeah. They've actually done studies on this, and they have found that therapists are no better than the general population in deciphering the truth. Um, there's one population that is... I don't know if you guys could take a guess. There's one group of people, like an actual job, that they're better than everyone else at discovering whether or not the person's telling you the truth or not. And it's not a lawyer, um, but it's policemen. Policemen, huh. for whatever reason, are significantly better. That plus uh, people with a particular disorder uh, related to personality disorders. It's a fascinating study. I think you'd enjoy it. Um, they... One of the struggles that people have who have personality disorders, these are people who've suffered a profound amount in their lives. And I think that's the part that often gets missed in the story of people who are acting in outrageous ways. You know, people with personality disorders are desperate for connection, desperate for attention and affection. And when you live that way, you're always trying to grab and hold on to whatever's in front of you. Like the idea of losing a friend or losing a loved one is like a catastrophe. And people always focus on the symptoms and they miss out on the person. If, if that's the way that you're living your life, it means that you feel no sense of groundedness, no sense of self. And the only way that you could survive your oxygen is a relationship with another person. And they found, they did this study where they showed what we call like micro expressions, where they'd, they'd show people pictures from no emotion to an extreme emotion. So 100 pictures within the span of like a second or two from no emotion to happiness, no emotion to sadness, no emotion to rage. And they would show general population and others these pictures and like one at a time and say, what emotion, what emotion, what emotion. Your average person was able to decipher the emotion, the correct emotion, and around slide 70. They were able to get, this is how the person felt. People with personality disorders. Um, and, and I like to extend it, like people who have suffered a great deal in their lives, mm -hmm. they're able to decipher that emotion on average at slide 50. And it says something, and I think it says something a lot about therapists in general. Like the, the superpower of a therapist is the ability not to decipher something in another, but to feel the experience of another. And then we need to ask ourselves, where does that come from? Mm -hmm. Like, why would you have the ability to feel more than the next person? And very often it comes from what we call like a, a wounded healer perspective. Like the good therapists, most of the really good therapists have their own stories to tell. Um, and, they, and it's a, as a result of those stories that they're able to really understand other people in a meaningful way. Um, it's a fascinating study. Like wow. They are literally able to pick up on other people's emotions before the rest of the world. Wow. They see things that we don't see. Is it a challenge as a therapist <clears throat> to want to relate to the struggle that's in front of you from your own personal experience, but still maintaining that professional 
vibe in the room. You want to be able to be empathetic, right? But you don't want to overshare and you want to maintain boundaries. Yeah, well, Is that a struggle. It's it's an interesting question, and uh, like how much there's like a, a general idea about therapy. Like you don't want to take it home with you. Um, and I'm I've, I'm a professor. I teach. I've trained probably nearly a thousand therapists within our community at this point. And like an intimate manner, not not like one class, but like a variety of classes. So you're like everyone's therapist. The therapist. You're therapist. like the well, grand therapist. I, I'm the grand teacher of the therapist <laughs> to, to a large degree. And it's something that I hold very, very dear to my heart. The responsibility of that is profound. Because I feel like when you're when you're educating the next generation of therapists, like you're you're giving them a voice. Because I know they're going to be sitting in a room with our people um, and trying to provide healing for them. So there's the, the, these ideas that you generally hear from therapy is that you don't want to take it home. You remain objective, somewhat professional. And I actually have a different belief system with it. Like I, I take my work home all the time, not in a way that like it's, it's with me and I can't function and I can't operate. When I go home, my role is to be a husband, to be a father, to be a human being. Um, but the people that I journey with are some of the dearest people in the world to me. These people are beautiful and they teach me so much about myself, about life and to not be touched by it, to not be affected by it and to just like remain objective to me is largely inhumane. So it's okay to feel other people and, and to carry that with a sense of care and responsibility. Um, and I, it's the greatest joy in the world. Let, just yesterday I had a client and I, I think we cried together for probably a half hour of the session. And it was over Zoom, which was a little bit awkward. That's hard. Yeah. It's like know. lagging. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. It's but like, wait, did they start laughing? Were they still crying? Like, still crying? It was wild. That's hard. It was, That's, wow. but it was so beautiful. It's it was, a very new age skill to be able to cry with someone over Zoom. Mm. Yeah. But it's, when I say crying, by the way, I just wanted to know, like, it's, it mean, I really mean emoting. Like, I, we're in tears, you know, but it was just like a real sense of, like, presence of, of, of emotional reality and vulnerability. And we, it was almost like a celebration. This is a guy that I, I worked with when he was in high school, one of these at-risk high schools, and he was nowhere near ready to go to therapy. Everyone wanted to send him to therapy, and he needed to go to therapy, but he wasn't interested, uh, which speaks about another point of therapy, that therapy is not, we're not capable of helping people who are not interested in getting help. Mm. There's no ability to trick someone into that. And I think the idea of like just forcing people into therapy is just a terrible idea because it, it ultimately ruins it for them in the future. You got to find another way to finesse it. So I worked with him for a period of time and I remember calling the parents saying, he's just not ready. Like, and, and they're like, well, what does that mean? He's just going to struggle for the next couple of years. And I said, probably. He's just not ready to start making change. He, he's, not, he's not willing. He's not open to confront himself yet. And then a few years later, after he did, he suffered for many years and self, self-harm. And um, he came back when he was ready and, and he was ready to look at himself. Um, and we were just sort of celebrating that moment of arrival. Here he is. Like to me, I see therapy works in like two very different stages. You have the, the putting out the fire stage, which is very active and trying to fix up the messes that you've created and understand why you're a mess to begin with. And then there's a much higher level of therapy, which is starting to ask yourself fundamental questions that we all ask ourselves, like, who am I? What are my strengths? What are my abilities? How could I use my life experience to bring some love into the world? And here's this guy that came from the darkest place and finally made his way to a place where he's doing really well. He's making money and he's struggling with religion a great deal, but he's the first thing that he's doing this, the first money that he made was give it back to the people. He said, he shared this story with me that was so beautiful. He said, when I was in high school, um, he said, I was, I was too, too high, too stoned to like really know what was going on. So he was traveling from one location to the next and he lost all of his clothing for the year. Like he was going into yeshiva with everything he got and it just, he had no idea where it went. And he called his father, and his father rightfully, rightfully so said, like, listen, son, like, I bought you everything. You're on your own. You got to figure this out. Wow. It was his way of saying, like, Man, uh, you know, natural consequences. Yeah, this is, this is the life consequence. And he went to yeshiva, um, and the Rebbe had a different perspective on it. And he said here, he immediately took out his checkbook, gave him like $700, and said, go buy some clothing. And this kid, 
now he's an adult. He's, you know, in his, in his twenties, beginning to make money, like beginning to like feel like a man and a, and a respectable human being. The first money he made went straight back to that yeshiva. And he said, wow. I want to contribute to this fund. That's beautiful. And it was just amazing to be a part of that, you know, it, and yes, if, like if I were to cut myself off from my feelings a little bit, I wouldn't be able to feel that moment with this guy. And what a great honor it is to join him in such a space, you know? Wow. I want to double click on something that you mentioned. It's always double clicking. Yeah. Oh. Let's, right click, let's, double click. It's my union. <laughs> let's double click, man. So you mentioned about finessing in the face of resisting therapy, yeah. right? So you mentioned growing up in your home, therapy was, was very prevalent, obviously. Well, we didn't go to therapy. But I think now as adults, I think we've all gone to therapy. Right. But you got <laughs> early stage exposure to oh, the concept. Sure. And the stigma probably didn't exist in your home. Not at all. Right. So for our generation, right, it's becoming more and more destigmatized. And God bless you for being part of that destigmatization. And that's awesome. Yeah. For, but recognizing that one might not do as well in therapy if they're being forced to go, right? If you're if some one of our listeners find themselves as part of the solution and they're open to therapy and they and they embrace the community and the concept and they have loved ones in their life who are closed off from it today, right? How do they not fall into that trap of forcing and instead finessing and inviting them, you know, their loved ones to be open to it instead? It's a really hard thing to do. There's no question. Like when you're woke, you know, you sort of wake <laughs> up and you're like, okay, I, it's okay. And I think we live in a world where I, I spend a lot of my time now in the Hasidic world in Williamsburg. I opened up a clinic there. We have 30 therapists. We're doing tremendous work in that that's, area. And that's, and I can't wait to discuss that because that is so interesting. It's, it's been such a wild, amazing Welcome to journey. us discussing it, by the way. Yeah. Uh, this we're is... right there. But it's, it, and when I start comparing like different communities and where they are with regards to therapy... Um, that, that community is the same place, let's say, our community, the five towns were 15 years ago, where no one would say anything about therapy. It was all hush-hush. It was filled with shame. Now you could go to a Shabbos meal with friends, and people are op openly speaking about their therapy. Um, and I think that's just a testament to all of us. Like, mm -hmm. we're all sort of, like, digging into our, our humanity, our vulnerability, and saying it's okay. Like, we're, we're, we, we don't need to applause, be perfect. Yeah? We do. Huh? We all deserve a round of applause. Heck, for it's, sure. Uh, Uphill Baxter has an applause feature. I don't know which one it is, though, so okay. it, might, it might be a Dude, booing. Dude, top I, right. It's got to be top I, right. I might start booing if I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that. Um, but that's uh, that's so true. I think it really we've come a long way, and pretty yeah. quickly, over the last like few years. Yeah, it didn't take... Yeah, and I think all it was, when, you're, when, you're, when we like boil it down, it's there's a voice of a vulnerability that's made its way into the world where it's okay we don't, like, there was the bravado, let's say, of, like, the 70s and 80s and, like, the idealized man, you know, the Marlboro man with cigarettes and he's tough and no emotions and he could handle anything. And now when you look at the people that we really value, I, I was watching the, uh, the interview that you had with, with Rev Weinberger, mm -hmm. um, and he's, he's ta talking about himself as a human being and he's a leader within our community. Um, and a leader of the leaders of our community. And when, when people see that and they notice like it's okay, I have permission to be. I don't have to pretend. I don't have to be something else. Um, and, and, and hopefully we keep moving in that direction. But just to go back to that question, what I found to be really helpful is, again, you can't force someone into a position of self-reflection. But if you surround them with self-reflection, uh, then it's, it's a bit contagious so if you have a child who's resisting and instead of like fighting it and pushing against them, you say, you know what, I'm going myself and I have a lot to learn and I want to begin to understand you. It creates more space for them to say, maybe it's okay. Or, or if you're dealing with, you have a couple and one is like just dug into this idea, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding my ground. Often you send a spouse and the spouse is growing and finding greater comfort within themselves. It's contagious. And it's less threatening because uh, people very often view therapy as like, I, I'm going to be called out on, on my stuff. And sometimes it, that is the case. Uh, but mostly it's an environment where you're placed into, an, in, into a space where you could self-reflect and really begin to look at yourself, you know, and, and say like, what, where did I come from? Where would I like to be? And what's really in the way? Um, and it's a deeply spiritual journey. It's, a, it's an emotional journey. 
Um, but finessing it, it goes a long way. And also making sure, like, not everyone's ready to change. Honoring that, too. What would you say to somebody that, like, let's say they are ready, but they're scared. Like, they, they grew up and therapy was, like, a four-letter word in their home. Right. I'm sure that applies for many. What would, what would you say to that? Well, again, I think if someone's ready, then all they need to do is, you know, take that, that leap and take that step, and, and they'll be okay. I, I think once... Once people make their way into that room, I, one of the things that we do in the clinic that I run, and, and I'm the director of the clinic, but last year I met every single person that came into the clinic for help. Um, and, and just to get a sense of what are the community's needs, who are these people that are seeking help, what could we do to meet it on a, on a global level, not just the people walking into our offices. And, and very, at the end of the meeting that I would have, I, say, I would always point out, I want you to know this is what therapy is. We just had a conversation about you, about life. This yeah. is it. It's two people it's sitting a in a room. Yeah, it's not like a scary old, like, you're not sitting. It's like, I guess Hollywood makes it very, or Holly, maybe Hollywood did, or Hollywood makes it very scary. Like, lay down on a couch and, like, let's take a deep dive into when you got hit in the head by a baseball bat when you were four years old. Right. But, like, well, that, that takes out years of working together probably with a therapist yeah yeah and again if you don't feel safe with your therapist you don't feel like this is a person who gets me who understands me who's on my side you're probably not in the right place right there if, are bad therap like there are therapists that are not good for sure 100 percent. i i think every therapist i know including myself we've had experiences where like you just didn't do good work for whatever reason you got triggered the wrong way uh it takes a lot of uh, just a, a sense of humility for you to acknowledge the fact that I'm good at a few things and that's about it. And which means every, there's no therapist in the world that could treat every person. It just doesn't work that way. You're, you have a certain language, you have a certain flow and there are certain people that connect with it and others don't. Um, I'm not a very practical and pragmatic therapist. I don't do like what we call, you know, CBT behavioral work. You know, the work that I'm trying to do is, is a lot more, is a lot deeper than that. And, it's about the essence of our being and, and self and a form of discovery. It's very meta. Yeah, it's quite meta. And I was giving a lecture recently, and, and th that's how I started. I said, like, there are many people that will come here and give you very, a lot of practical advice. I'm just not a practical person. Mm -hmm. But I, and I don't live <laughs> Half practically. Half the room gets up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, like, they don't necessarily. But in the end, they, they could yeah. appreciate it. Because if you, you reach somebody and you remind them, that they, like everybody else, like myself, like you, um, we're fragile people. Yeah. And we have, we have things that we're unsure of within ourselves. And it, if you simply lend permission for people to feel that in a non-threatening way, I think there's a part of everyone that sort of holds on to that. Like everyone needs to hug themselves every once in a while. You mentioned a few times, I think, the, the concept of sort of permission. Permission, permission. It's like the permission to be. Well, could you like, I guess delve into that a little bit what that what that means it's a could you for a moment i don't mean to, this is such a therapist let's thing do I'm it yeah. let's oh jump right in gosh shoot i was about to turn it on you can't, that's what therapists go for do it. Go you for can't it. bill me for this right <laughs> <laughs> no billing no turn billing. off the meter you know uh, yeah yeah but they um think for a moment about the people do i close my eyes no, no, no. Okay, You're good. good. We could look, <laughs> look, at, look right here. We're Close good. my eyes, this guy. I don't know what he's going to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> think, think for a moment about the people in your life that gave you permission to take risks, to, to try permission. something. When you say permission, what does that mean? We're, we're afraid to put ourselves on the line because we might be evaluated, we might be judged. I'll share my experience here. You reached out to me. I was deeply yeah. honored to say, you know, it's like just the whole notion of meaningful people. And, and immediately I was sort of hit with this question of, am I meaningful? Mm. What exactly does that mean? What could I say that people would make me feel meaningful? You thought into like, it way too much. <laughs> well, it's Didn't just, change name. It, no, it's a beautiful name. Yeah. It's right. It's, it's, it's ideal, yeah. but it, it activates a part of us that is, 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 is aware of our limitations and our fears. And and I think that when you, when you think about the people who make an impact on our lives that allow us to change and become like a greater version of ourselves, it's often the people that see something in us that we're afraid to see. And to me, I call that permission. Mm -hmm. I have... It's empowering. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. I was in 11th grade. I myself was... Uh, again, I came from... 
a beautiful place, but also a troubled place. You know, you don't grow up with a father. It, it, leaves, it leaves a real, uh, an empty space within you, a sense of yearning, a sense of loss. And, and, and I was searching for someone to replace that. And, and at the same time, I was pushing anyone away who got even close to me in that type of way. And I had a Rebbe, my Rebbe is still to this day, he's from 11th grade. His name is Rabbi Ari Center from Muncie. Um, one of the, the, the most meaningful moments in my career I was doing a, a lecture with my wife for a fundraiser for Amudim. I serve on the board at Amudim, the clinical advisory board. And so we did this recorded piece, and, and Svi Gluck reached out to my Rebbe, and he said, uh, would you like to, not, not knowing that it was me, he said, would you like to, you know, sponsor this piece? And it was, like, it was a lot of money to sponsor a piece for such an event. And my Rebbe said, he goes, so long as Kivi Perlman is presenting, I'm going to sponsor the whole thing. Um, but I want to be the one who introduces him. And I can't tell you what that was like for me. He's, he's a, a man who saw things in me that I did not have the ability to see in myself at that point in my life. I, I was filled with doubt, filled with fear, filled with the unknown. And somehow he saw something in me that empowered me to take steps in the right direction. But I remember I was in a classroom and I forget exactly what the argument was, but there was a guy in my class that so we got into some, some fight. And, and I'm a pretty, as you could imagine, I'm, I'm a pretty docile guy. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the fighter type. The few fights that I got in, I took a few punches because I told <laughs> the person I don't hit people. You know, that was my way of responding. And some, some people took advantage of that. Um, and, uh, but I, I did. I put my hands by my side. Who would hit someone like that? But it, I, I could tell you some names if you'd like. Yeah, let's hurt go. People. <laughs> hurt people, hurt, hurt people. Hurt people, that was it. Yeah, and I put my hands by my side. I said, listen, if you need to hit me, hit me. But I just I assure you, I'm not going to hit you back. Did you absorb it? I absorbed it. Took it I took it the best I could. And, uh, wow. uh, but it was nice. I got a lot of sympathy from the crowd. So that yeah. felt okay. Um, and so I got into some, some, some type of thing with this friend. And, 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 and rage emerged in me, which is like not very typical. I don't get you know, too rageful. And I said some choice words at this guy. And I didn't know my rabbi was in the room. Mm. And he was just sitting there listening and observing the story. And, and of course, and, and I remember he saw me and he goes, <clears throat> you know, like just like pointing out that he's there. And I'm like, okay, I'm, it's time to get suspended again. It was last week. Okay, another time. I deserve it. I earn it. I've earned this one. Um, but, but he didn't go in that direction. I mean, it did. I did end up getting in trouble for this, but that was later. The direction he went in is he pulled me to the room next door and he said, like, Kivi, are you okay? And he just asked it in a way that I believed him. And it wasn't, it wasn't an, an implication. He wasn't angry at me. He wasn't frustrated. He was really concerned about me. And I remember, like, it was a moment, like, I allowed myself to, like, lean into that question. And... And tell him that I wasn't, you know, to let him know that. Like, no, I'm, I'm really not okay. I'm not doing well. And he ended up opening up his home to me. I lived in his house for a little bit after that. Um, and to me, that's like permission. Like, he gave me permission to see something in myself that I wasn't able to see at that moment. And I think when you're dealing with people who have these histories of loss and trauma and suffering, they've completely lost sight of the people that they are. They don't know that they're beautiful. They don't know that they're wonderful. They don't know that they have resilience and strength. All they see is the story of, I'm a person who's been wounded. And that's the only narrative that they live with. And when you sit in a room with a person like that, and you somehow tap into what is a deeper part of them, um, a, a more honest part of them, that's not just wounded, that's filled with strength and filled with beauty, um, they somehow allow themselves to see that too. Um, oh, some sure. some of the greatest people I know are the most wounded. That's the honest truth. It's a major shout out to your Rebbe, first of all. Like that's yeah. that's amazing. But we were, let's get back to that exercise. So now that we know what permission is, oh, now he wants his therapy back. <laughs> yeah, like I'm taking advantage of this one. <laughs> no, so again, I, so I was bringing up that story. Like when you think it, it, what you're doing here is quite brave. What you're doing here takes a great deal of risk. You're putting yourself on the line. Not only you, your reputation, your standing within a community. I'm sure people love what you do. I'm sure people are somewhat critical of that. Oh, yeah. And, and when you ask yourself, where did I get that strength from? Where did I, where did I discover the strength to take risks uh, and, and enter into an unknown space? Um, to me, I imagine somewhere along the way, I don't know your story. I'd love to know one day. We could, we could sit down without the cameras rolling and <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah, talk. Don't turn it on me right now. This is your, this is your episode. <laughs> no, but I'm saying I imagine if we just scanned, scanned your life. Yeah. I imagine that there were people there that 
sure. believed in you when you didn't believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. And they gave you permission to lean into a, a vulnerable space enough for you to say, you know what, I'm willing to try something new. Um, and, and I know that I live a life that's filled with tremendous risk. Um, even when it's a session at a time, there's tremendous risk. It's, you're dealing with a person's life. But beyond that, some of the bigger things that I've done, like, you know, starting programs and building other university programs, um, it comes from all the people. And that's what I was saying before. Like when I, when I'm doing anything, I feel this like team of people around me that are, that are just there holding me. You know, I think of my brothers, I think of my siblings and people that care about me, believe in me, love me. And it gives me the opportunity to walk into a space where I very well know I could fail. And I, and I often believe that I will or might, but I still have some strength to say, let me give it my best shot because hopefully I could help someone at this moment. Because you got that permission. Yeah. You're I walking that. in with like ammo. Yeah. Yeah. There's it's that like permission. sort of like the poker chip analogy, you know, similar. Like, yeah, I love that. By the way, you know is this the, the part shirt? where you say it. No, come on, you know it. We all know that one. Rick Lavoie, man. You don't know it. Poker there might chips. Be some listeners that don't know it. What's well, the classic Rick Lavoie story? We'll let the doctor say it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a basic analogy where he said that you know each of us, each of us have a certain amount of poker chips that we start our day with. Some of us start with ten thousand, and then everything that we do, we put in another hundred, another hundred. We have that ability, and then you have those individuals, unfortunately who have five or 10 and everything that they do requires so much energy and so much effort. And it, it's such an, an accurate description of what it means to live in the world without a, a foundation, without a backbone. And unfortunately, I think all of us on some level have this one way or another, but there are some, and I think that's, that's always been like my, I can't, I don't know if I could call it mission, but maybe it is a mission. Maybe it's fair enough to say that. To like give those people a voice, you know, to sit with them. The, the dearest people in the world to me are the people who are suffering and wounded. And I think Mike and, and just being there with them and, and growing with them, learning from them, um, but also being there with them in a way where I could believe in them in a way that they don't even know how to believe in themselves yet. And uh, it's just the greatest honor in the world. I think that's so cool. Yeah. For the record, my wife is the most empowering person and most meaningful person in my life. Well, mine too. Because you had to go there. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Not but. And you've inspired me to express gratitude, however, to my business partner, Cheski Asaf, who I think gave me this permission that you're talking about in that hyper-focused example where, like you said, there's going to be people that like what you're doing. There's going to be haters. Yeah. And, you know, when Nahi asked me if I would join this platform as a co-host, and I talked about it with him, he opened my eyes to that reality, right. but gave me that permission and said, if you have something to give and you have something to do, and this is such a good example of helping someone like you spread the light of your message, yeah. that's something that we can do to give people permission. That's awesome. 100%. I, 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 I'm not a very self-confident human being. Like internally, there isn't this belief that I have that I have something that I could offer others that they don't have. It's not something that I internally live with. But I do live with this permission to, whether or not I feel that way, give it a go and try my best. And, and, and so many people have contributed to that. Um, my children have contributed to that. Just like the way they, their beauty and their, their ability to, to just be who they are and permission to lean into that. I have my, my son is here in the room. Yeah, he just, did, like, he just gave himself a pat on the back. <laughs> he should. He should give himself a pat on the back. He's one of the dearest people in the world to me. Um, and uh, they, they just, they humble us. And yeah. they remind us, they remind us that it's okay to try and sometimes to fail. And that's okay. And, and you still have that support network with you. We'll be right back to this episode. Right back. But first. Right back. A message from our friends at Aleph Beta. You know, we had an episode with Rabbi David Foreman, who is the founder of Aleph Beta, mm -hmm. which is an awesome, awesome organization platform. They have an really amazing is. app. They're they're like around for a very long time. Yeah. And they're incredible. His content is incredible. It's that time of year. It's Tisha B'Av season. Yeah. People are craving yeah. meaningful content. It's it's a time where we're looking, we're searching, we're yearning. The the Gaula vibes are in the air and we want to put it somewhere. We wanna we wanna consume meaningful content. 
So besides for listening to this podcast and all the other stuff Meaningful Minute does, I highly suggest going to check out Aleph Beta and you can get $18 off right now of their premium subscription. I am a premium subscriber of Aleph Beta. I pay for it because honestly, the content is like no other. You're not going to be able to find content like that anywhere else. Not on this platform, not on any other, pl- on any other platform. So go ahead. Use promo code MEANINGFUL22. You'll get $18 off of a premier subscription with Olive Beta. MEANINGFUL22, 22, because 22, it's 2022. 20, oh, that's what it is? I think it's 22. I thought it was just like random gematria or something. Nice. Nice, right? You know, it might be 22 because of 2022, 20, but it also might be 22 because there's 22 letters in the Olive base. Right? I don't know. It's too late to even think about that. <laughs> but anyways, head to olivebeta.org. That's A-L-E. P-H-B-E-T-A dot org. That's alphbeta.org. Meaningful 22 when checking out. Save yourself $18. And enjoy the content. Yeah. To me, you seem like one of the most present people I've mm-hmm. ever spoken to. Like, you're you're really here right now. And I'm not even here. Like, my <laughs> mind is on a million things. And I'm just like, and I admire what what, like, who you are. And I'd love to have some of that if you can share. Like, what... Wow. <laughs> what sauce are you working with? Because you're well, so you're like you're like here. Yeah. Well, this is a special place to be. But you know, I, I bet you're you're wherever you are. You're there. I well, I, I'll be honest. I just this yomtif, my my other son, um, my younger son. Um, it's something that we were like consciously working on together. Like, how could we be in yomtif together? And I remember walking. We walked like thirty minutes to a shear. And just like, just enjoying that moment. And it was like every step we took, it just felt precious. Um, it's not an easy thing to be present all the time. And, and to tell you the truth, um, it, even though I try my best, I, I often fail at being present. Um, but, but when I'm with people and I'm, I'm in that space that to me, I see this as sacred space. When you're sharing a moment with another person, like to me, that's all I want. All I want is to be with others. And my deepest fear is arriving at a day and and this day will come and I hope I'm prepared for it where I no longer will have that ability to sit with others in a meaningful way and that to me I I don't know what I would do with myself in that place like I've learned to just so deeply appreciate like the the gift and the opportunity I have to just be with others in every regard wow Wow. like that's so crazy so I'm gonna double click to use that term again click away and so Nahi was clearly just evidently attracted to the presence that you have yeah. in the room. And that's, that's incredible. I think you are uniquely positioned to explain to our listeners the value of being present because our youth are growing up in a generation where I've said this in the past, we used to live on farms, then we lived in cities and now we live on the internet. Yeah. And when people are living on the internet, it's very difficult to be present. What is the value of being present to one's mental health? When you, I forget, like mental health, not, not aside, mental health is essential to this. But when we think about it, and I think it's, it might be easier. I know it's easy to speak about adolescence and what they're going through. Um, but I think we've always, every generation has always focused on the adolescence and the ills of adolescence. But I, if it's okay, just to shift a little bit to adults. Sure. We live in a culture that does not in any way um, value presence. Mm. We're all thinking about our 401ks, and our 403Bs, and how much money do I have so I could survive later? And what could I do today so that I'm going to have enough success that later on I'm going to be fine? And, and when you think about what that means, it, it, and again, I, I do this as well, and they've done research on this, like how many times people actually look at their, their money for the future as opposed to being in the moment. Um, it just means that we're not present. We're not, we're not with ourselves. When you sit at a Shabbos table, I was sitting with a, with a client. We did some beautiful work together. And he grew up in a home that was very conditionally informed. You had to be a certain way. It was, and there was only one way to be. I was a very prominent, wealthy family. And this is the only way that you could be. And the journey that he's on right now, and recently he, he embarked on his own personal journey that was glorious. I don't know what else to say. Um, where he's sort of reclaiming himself and saying, like asking himself these fundamental questions, like who am I really? And how could I honor that and respect that? Um, But so much of of the language that he was raised with was you need to be a certain way so that your children will get married, 
so that you're going to get the right shidduchim or you're going to have the right amount of, of kavod and respect within the community. And that whole idea, that whole premise that we're almost encouraged to engage in is like the greatest distraction from ourselves. And when you think about a moment, if you can just take a moment and say like, what is it like to be here? Yeah. To meet somebody new, to, to hear something new, to, to feel something new within ourselves. And even though it's like such a challenging thing to do, the gift of that, because it's the only thing we really have is the present. We don't have real control of the future. I think we like to control the future. It's our way of sort of, you know, feeling immortal and, and like we're going to be here forever. So we create a world where everything is safe and comfortable and we have enough of a cushion and we don't have to live in the unknown. The present is a very frightening place to be, but it's also the most beautiful place to be. And I struggle with this a great deal with my presence. I'm a very motivated person. Um, and it's been a very interesting journey for me because you never really think about arriving anywhere when you're motivated. All you think about is, I want to accomplish something. But right. then when you arrive, you then ask yourself the question of, what was it all worth it? Mm. Like, what does that really mean? Okay, so now I'm in the place where I want it to be. And, and now what? What do I do now? And then all you're left with is yourself. And so at some point or another, we're going to have to find a way to confront ourselves and be present and ask ourselves, do we really, really like who we are? Are we honoring who we are? Are we living a life that is aligned with the way we'd like to live our lives? And that's, that's to me, those are the happiest people in the world, the most content people in the world. It sounds like that's everything. Like being present is like everything. And you, everything builds on top of that. Yeah, that, think, think about the difference between talking to a person about how you'd like your children to have a Shabbos meal versus actually sitting at your Shabbos meal with your children. Mm -hmm. And how many of us actually do that? Like you look around your Shabbos meal and you say, these are my, these are my kinderlach, these are my children. And they we're here together in this moment and we're celebrating Shabbos. Well, and it's the hardest thing to do, but it's... If yeah, we, and you mentioned that like practicality is not necessarily your thing, but like I'm, I'm thirsty for what you're putting down here. Like, and I want to know practically how does one... Maybe there's an exercise or something that people could do to achieve that. Like what? I'd go home tonight. I don't care if your kids are sleeping or awake. And give them a kiss and mean it. And say, you're the greatest gift to me. And take a moment to look your wife in the eye and say, thank you for journeying with me in this unknown space. And I deeply appreciate it. And, but do it in a way that it's not like I need to do it but I want to do it. I want to be in this space. I, I really, really feel it. What would my life be without this? I'd, I don't know where I would be without my wife. It wouldn't, it just wouldn't be. It's, you know, it's called marrying up. And, and I was one of those guys that just simply got lucky. Um, and uh, yeah, it was wonderful. We found each other in NCSY. That was the story. Oh, really? It was a great story. Like a Shabbat, like a Shabbat or something? Or? We, yeah, we were both working there. She was there a little bit more full time, not working, volunteering to to help kids. Um, and again, I think it's one thing about a therapist. Like therapists were were always therapists. I was a therapist when I was a lifeguard. You know, for some reason, the kids who couldn't swim, the kids who couldn't dunk their head, I somehow knew how to help those kids. Oh, well, you should have saved the kid instead of asking him how he felt about it when he was. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I did, but I wanted him yeah, to yeah. know what it was like. <laughs> Looking to install like couches at the bottom of the pool. yeah <laughs> yeah no it's always good to save first like how do you feel I'm, I'm, I have a cramp I mean <laughs> it feels pretty bad yeah oxygen I'm in need of <laughs> oxygen right now yeah That's no but it was great no we were both there in in the NCSY environment I was doing uh, you know volunteer work she was doing volunteer work and we both we, you know we met each other we spoke a little bit and uh, we I think we got to see each other interact in our natural environment and we both asked the same person to set us up with one another. And that was, wow. that was the end of the story. That's I awesome. came home, told my mom, met my wife, and that was it. That's awesome. Yeah, I want to uh, uh, transition, transition this conversation to something that you're currently doing, which I think is pretty cool. Um, actually, there's two things I want to say. One thing I want to say first is you mentioned you're a therapist for therapists. Yes. You trained over a thousand from therapists, and you kind of like, besides for training them, you also provide therapy for them. Right. Well, it's something, it, it, wasn't a pl it wasn't part of the plan. And I think so many parts of life are not a part of the plan. You know, if you show up and you just want to do your best at all times, it'll bring you to the right place. Um, and so much that I could, 
so much of, of, of the growth that I've found and, and whatever success, however you want to define it, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I've been, I'm very grateful. But uh, I think it's a strange thing to refer to yourself as a successful person. Mm. Uh, but in my field, thank God, I've done pretty well yeah, for you're myself. Yeah, pretty, you're, you're, you're pretty successful. Yeah, thank God, you know, and uh, I, I humbly accept that. Um, and when you're, you're, you find yourself in a position of, of giving and training and doing for others, um, and you're doing therapy, um, then somehow it's just started happening over time that some of the clients that I was getting were other therapists seeking therapy. And it's not an easy thing for a therapist to go to therapy. Why not? Um, because they know too much. Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like chefs eating each other's food. It's like, yeah, you, you used the fake stuff for this, didn't you? You know, like, yeah, so they're very specific. They know they know the direction you're going in, and they could tell you why you're going in that direction because they do the same exact thing. I was, I was, I figured that. And how do you like? What's the? How do you work around that? Well, I think at the end of the day, and I've had some real interesting experiences like this. Like I've had therapists walk in and say, like, you cannot use X, Y, and Z intervention with me ever, and they'll call me out on it. So I'm like, sort of like left on my toes. Like, okay, how do I go in a certain direction but without utilizing a particular perspective? Well, first of all, I guess, what's the importance of have a therapist re receiving therapy? Is it, is it like necessary and, and what's the importance of that? Well, there, there are two different elements. What's necessary is supervision. Therapists, therapists need to be in supervision. Okay. Uh, they need to be checking themselves. They need to be held accountable. Every therapist is going to struggle with different cases and they need to have someone that they're reviewing that with. Um, I think it's one of the, the beauties of our clinic that really sets us apart from most others is that the, the supervisors at our clinic are the therapists who are, have full practices charging three fifty an hour. And I've somehow managed to convince them to come and work for me for one day out of the week. And so these new therapists coming into the field are being trained by some of the most experienced therapists out there, which is a far cry from what generally takes place in clinics. Right. And the good news is I think that clinics are starting to, begin to embrace a similar model as well. I would love for clinics to become more reliable for people so they could get therapy for an affordable rate. You know, it's really for a family that's struggling, then needing to come up with a significant amount of money every month for therapy is not an easy thing. You need to do it anyway sometimes, but it's just not an easy thing. If there's another way around, we'd like to do it. So, so supervision is critical. Therapy is a human being going to therapy. When a therapist, when I go to therapy... I'm taking a break right now, but I'll probably make my way back at some point soon. Um, that when I go to therapy, it's not because I'm a therapist. It's because I'm Kiwi Perlman having a hard time in my life. And I'm dysregulated or not present or just struggling with my own sense of humanity. And I'm going, I'm reaching out to someone for help so I could feel a little bit more humane in my own skin. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with any of the things that you're going home with from your workplace, but it could just be from life in general. Yeah, just life. You know, I've, I've, I've got a lot of baggage that I'm carrying and I have a lot of triggers that'll, you know, activate that baggage. And, and sometimes I get lost. Yeah, it's like even doctors need to go to doctors for their yearly checkups. Like, that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but it's just, it's, it's as a, I'm not, when I, if I'm going to therapy, when I'm going to therapy, I'm going not as a doctor, I'm going as a client. Um, and I'm really allowing myself to be cared for the way I would do that with somebody else. Um, and I think that therapy is not so much about wit. It's one of the things that for people who've been to therapy for a long time, they begin to realize this, that, that yes, analysis is a wonderful thing like where you have that moment of clarity. You're like, you realize I've been doing the same type of mistake in relationships and it's related to my mother or it's related to my father and this is just the way I operate. So you have that moment of clarity. And then you go home and it's a week later and you're doing the same exact thing again. So it's, it's one of the, the, the fundamental ideas is that knowing something doesn't necessarily mean that you know it or that you feel it. You can know a lot about yourself and still live in a, a pretty dysfunctional way. Yeah. Um, so we go to therapy because we're human and we're struggling and we're carrying our own baggage and we need help with it. Um, and I think that's the hardest part when I'm working with other therapists, which at, at this point, the majority of the clientele that I work with are other therapists, um, is getting beyond the fact that they're therapists and just getting to a place of it's two human beings sitting in a room, having dialogue, meaningful dialogue about their lives. And, uh, 
And again, it, it really depends how you conceptualize what therapy is. Right. If you conceptualize it as I need to be more witty than the person that I'm working with, or I need to be a step ahead of them, then yeah, it could get really complicated. But if you see therapy as I'm a fellow traveler, um, which is a real idea that I embrace a great deal, that we're all, we're all human, we're all flawed, we all struggle with similar things one way or another, um, then that gives us the ability to say, okay, let's, let's get beyond the titles, let's get beyond everything else, and let's get to the fundamentals where people with wounds, and we need to find a way to feel okay with ourselves. And who doesn't feel that way? Mm-hmm. You know, who, who, I've yet to really meet that person. I've met people who pretend like they don't feel that way. I feel like the people who look like they don't are the ones who need it the most. Right. They're the ones who are living most protected lives. And which is painful, which could, you're, you're like, it's like a seltzer bottle. Where did yeah. it pop? You have to, this is the way Sponsored it works. Sponsored by Rishis. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Rishis yeah. Cold Seltzer. <laughs> Very our, our range of emotion is, it works, it works both ways on both sides. So if you cut off vulnerability, you're also cutting off happiness. Um, and wow. the more you could expand one, the more you expand the other. So if you're sort of presenting yourself as like, I'm the complete human being, the, your range of emotion, certainly in the happiness end, is going to be profoundly limited. Speaking of vulnerability, something you, you're involved with now that um, you're the director of is ODA, which um, is in Williamsburg. Yeah. And yeah. you you require, I guess, a lot of vulnerability from the Hasidic community to partake in therapy and maybe in, in in the circles that it's very very accepted nowadays they may be a few steps behind on that the stigma may, may exist a little bit more if it's if it's you know safe to say uh, it's very safe to say um i've had a, a deep 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 love for the hasidic community from when i was a kid um i said, I, I said hasidic i don't know why i think i'm on cnn or something <laughs> <laughs> someone's gonna call, say hasidic someone's, yeah. gonna call, someone's gonna call me out like who are you talking to <laughs> this uh, isn't joe rogan like what yeah, yeah go they, on. just just I, see like this that's what goes on in my head like all day go on it's wonderful <laughs> it's wonderful just take it in man yeah the um i the relationship that i have to my yiddishkeit was all through the the, the realm of hasidus not necessarily what hasidus is today it's a it's a very different world from what it was you know, back in the Carpathian Mountains, um, where, you know, they were very small groups, you know, like, the, yeah. like Bells, for example, was one of the biggest Hasidic groups. They had like a small, a small following, you know, a thousand people was a big, big deal. Um, and now you have well, what's going on in Sotner, what's going on in Williamsburg is it's a, a whole, it's a whole universe out there. And now the Five Towns also. Uh, a lot of Hasidim. Oh, you have Hasidim moving here as well? No, it's a it's, uh, different type of Hasidim. Right, like a neo, it's, neo Hasidic yeah. uh, uprising. Payas and the Neshama Hasidim. Yeah, no, but they're borrowing. So, again, yeah. that's always been like my language towards Yiddishkeit. Yeah. Um, and I grew up that way. The stories at the Shabbos table were, were of the Baal Shem and the Chos of Lublin. Like, these were just the stories you grew up with. And those are the stories that I share. My table, it's the same stories. Um, it's like the, the fabric of my Yiddishkeit comes from wow. that place. So the Hasidic community has always been very near and dear to my heart. And it was only like uh, five to ten years ago where I was teaching in university where they started having uh, Hasidic people coming into the program. And, and these guys were like literally taking tremendous risks because there was no one in the community really valuing what they were doing. There was a whole system set up in the Hasidic community of Askanim and Rabbanim who are really guiding everybody. Right. Um, and therapy was never considered. It's a lot, of it, a lot of it has been about advice. Do this, do that, we'll fix the problem that way. But it's not so much about healing and let's listen and self-discovery. It's about managing problems. Quick message from our friends at Turo University, which, by the way, they are a university. Tova Bram, a really cool name, Bram. Tova, strong name. It's Tova strong Bram, name. who is a very successful woman in tech. What you're watching right now, what you're listening to right now, is tech. It really is. And Tovan today works. At She's face- at Facebook, right? At Facebook Live. She's on the Facebook Live team. So so where'd that journey start for Tova? Turo University. It started at Turo University. So you have high dreams, aspirations of getting and working for American Express or Facebook or TikTok or Twitter. It doesn't have to just be at a college in the Ivy League. It could also be at Turo University. So head to turo.edu forward slash more 
Turo.edu forward slash more. You can find out how Tova did what she did. She oh, look at, at her bio, by the way. Yeah, she's, she's done at, some really incredible she, stuff. She was at BlackRock. She was. And now she's at Facebook Live. Facebook Live. That's crazy stuff. Anyways, back to this episode. Have you had any stories that happen within the community? You don't have to mention names uh, of where it took place about feeling that resistance on a very high level. Well, first of all, I, I do want to start by saying that there's been so much wonderful reception to what we're doing. I right. mean, we literally, I started with this program uh, two years ago. It's an existing program. They had five therapists at the time. Um, and as of September, we're going to have around 40. Wow. Uh, that are completely full and with groups and... What does that uh, say about, like, the the state of the nation? Like, either that's, oh, people are getting help and they weren't before, or it's, it's just people are just dropping like flies. People are thirsty or they need air, like... Well, I think it's the language that we have today. I mean, when you look at, let's say, the time of the Rambam, like the language that they had at the time was philosophy. That's what, that's what people focused on. You go to several generations before the Rambam, they were looking up at the skies. I'm talking about and, even like 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Right, but there's no well, chance it's an indication of more problems. It's certainly an indication of just, more acceptance of this particular solution. Right. Well, again, coronavirus was horrific for humanity, meaning whatever problem you had, let's yeah, say it was uh, like, it just magnified, it just got exacerbated. There's not a single therapist who has room. A Relief, which is a wonderful organization, they provide referrals. They're really struggling with finding therapists today Crazy. that they could really refer to. Um, and, and all the other, Amudim also, like they're, they're having a hard time finding the right people uh, because any name that you're familiar with, they don't have any time. They're booked for months. They're booked. They just don't have the ability to see somebody. Time now. to be a therapist. Like, time, like, if you're like 18 now, you know what to go to school for. Right. No, there's no now question. he's working in the Turo University. Yeah, Turo University. Social work. But he went, yeah, he was yeah. a, he's a YU professor. So. Well, it's, it's well, why you connected to Sarah Schneer. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, Sarah Schneer uh, connected with YU. Right. And uh, it's a fabulous program. Like the level, what I really appreciate about what they're doing is they're focusing on the quality of the education where like they're every single professor they it's not have. a machine they're not trying to just they're not just trying to make therapists they're trying to make quality therapists yes yeah. so the, and they're quite selective a little bit elitist in that sense where they're looking for the people that are trying to better themselves mm -hmm. as opposed to getting a piece of paper mm -hmm. and many people go into the field with a belief like i know what i'm doing i just need the piece of paper so i can charge effectively um and then you realize through the education process that there's so much that you just don't know right and there's so much you need to work on yourself in order to get there. Right. Um, one of the first things that, that we did when we opened up the program ODA? was yeah, at ODA yeah. is we were moving into a new location. We need a larger place because I hired some new, new therapists right, right out of the gate. And uh, there was this question, do we create partitions in the waiting room? Because it could um, be, yeah, people go be a little bit self-conscious. Yeah, there's a stigma. There's a sense of shame. And the one thing I was like adamant about um, was we, we're not doing partitions. Like if we're going to be successful in this environment, we're going to have to make it okay. That's bold. It was quite bold. And I, I would say it was virtually everyone was against me at that time. Wow. And they're like, what is this, you know, this American guy coming into Williamsburg trying to figure out what's going on over here. But it was a deeply seated belief that I had that we're only going to be effective if we name what we're doing. And we're mm -hmm. doing therapy. We're not doing anything else. We're not tutors. We're doing real legitimate therapy. And if it's a clinic, you're going to sit in that room like everybody else, and it's going to be okay. We did open up a back entrance, but I would say in any given year, we have a few people that use the back entrance, and that's it. Um, and that's everyone amazing. else sits that's there. Probably because of what you, what you did. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't easy in the beginning for people to... It wasn't so hard, to be honest. They I just think needed that push, you're saying? If, if you believe in people's higher self, they tend to step into it. You know, if you treat people like you need to be afraid of yourself, they tend to fear themselves. If you look at a person and you say, it's okay, I also go to therapy. I do most of the intakes and I'll, and then, you know, like they'll sometimes express some degree of fear and I'll be like, it's, it's okay. I'm as human as you are and let's embrace that together. Um, and people do. And now we literally have like trauma groups that people said would never happen. People from the same community getting together, talking about some really, really sensitive subject matters. We have parenting groups where parents come together. But obviously there are other elements of resistance as well. Yeah. And just one story, we got uh, like one of the leaders in the community, they reached out because we, we really created a buzz uh, within the community. Um, I have, it's interesting, there's a, a Yiddish speaking 
magazine called the, like the Moment, uh, and they have a uh, they have a, a section comes out once a month that that's related to therapy, and I and I have a a piece there every single month. I write a column, but I have no idea what it says because it's <laughs> all in Yiddish. <laughs> but they're basically they've gone online. They've taken all my lectures. And they'll translate them into Yiddish. They could be writing the most terrible things about it. For all I know, they could. (laughs) I'm not quite sure what they're saying, but people seem to like it, so it's okay. We get some nice feedback. Took away the partitions. This guy. (laughs) Yeah, what's going on? (laughs) And he's a redhead. Um, (laughs) Yeah, listen. Well, we 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 could talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's good. I always feel I want you to know. Are you a redhead though? Well. Dude, I'm going to tell you something. It, it starts to go away at a certain point. Oh, but yeah, what? I was I was a real redhead. Like, really? Just like you. Well, it's amazing. I, it didn't go like gray. It's just making. It's like a. It's like a. It's like autumn on your head. It's yeah. like a different color. I'm transitioning yeah. at this point. Yeah. So it's it's, awesome. Yeah, that's what happens. Like red here sort of turns, I think, brownish and then gray. What? That's yeah. I have, I have no you, way to relate to this <laughs> discussion for anyone that's not on YouTube. In the back head, I don't of your, you I didn't have, start out have as seven a or eight hairs on my head. <laughs> But you should know None of which a, are red. <laughs> I have like a kinship. When I see, do you have this? A like redhead? When, when you see you another the redhead, you the do you like, it's just like a fist pump. It's like, what's up? We're in this together. But sometimes I see, I see like a redhead and I, that like, you know, like they like a real redhead, like white skin as this table. Like the stereotypical. Right. Orange hair, freckles. And I'm like, I can't relate. <laughs> I can't relate. <laughs> that's not my, he's not, I, it's not part of my clan. It's not my color. I'm more of like an Auburn. <laughs> you, you, you probably like, you took the brunt of it. Yeah. And, uh, like I don't know. Like I, I think I think of things in terms of sports. Like, is there any real ginger in the NBA? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Does there have is to there? be a real ginger <laughs> in the NBA? I think there has to be. Oh, he's saying Brian Scalabrini, the red, <laughs> the red Mamba. You know, one ginger in the game of a red Mamba nickname. You know, <laughs> he was like, Brian Scalabrini. He's known like when he won the championship on the Celtics. Like in the press conference, he said, five years, I'll tell my kids that I played ten minutes." 10 years, I'll tell my kids that I started. 20 years, I'll tell my one MVP, and no one will know. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, wonderful. It's awesome. Yeah, so I guess back to the Hasidic community. Yeah, Hasidic. So, they, I, yeah so, so I've, I've, I've had, obviously, there, there are moments where there's fear. You yeah. know, I, I've, I've been meeting with virtually every leader in the community, the Rabbanim, the Askanim, and, and to be honest, the overwhelming majority of them have my cell phone number. They're calling me up all the time with different issues and cases. And we're, we're responding accordingly. We're like, we're taking very good care of them. But there are obviously other stories where yeah. people are really fearful of what we're doing. And, and I get it. I honor it. Fearful like, or like, like, just like, like, what do you like? Well, when you have double click on that, well, you have a system that's been in place for a long time. Yeah. Which is, and is a system or it's like a lack of a system. It is a system. Sure, they have a system. a system. What's the system? Well, you go, the oh, you go to the rabbi. The rabbi gives hadracha and shine. Well, not only that, you have the Rebbe, number one, and but also you have within within your group, you have Rabbanim and you have Askanim, you have Mashbim. people that have been, yeah, like designated as the people who deal with this this issue, that issue. And it, it's amazing that, that there's so many people in the community that are so well informed um, and they're so well read. Uh, they, they're not going to go to school, but but they, they know these things like in the back of their hand. It's amazing to see. See them are amazing. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. People How? literally, I, t- I tell my what? kids all the time. No, I love it. I Why love are you laughing? You. I'm not. I'm enjoying. It's, it's a, I, I love it. I can't tell. It's, it's a wild thing. I walk around Williamsburg all the time, even doing supervision. It's a nice day, and I'm supervising a few therapists. We'll take a walk together, um, and we're just walking around. I'm like, and I just feel so at home. Like, these are my, these are my people. Yeah. It's my I took clan. enjoyment yeah. before my laughing was yeah. enjoying what you were saying, and to, to reiterate it. Yeah. Anything the Hasidim decide to get into, they do and they, they kill just it. crush it to the nth degree. Like yeah. they took over Yabchik, they kill it. Anything. I don't anything create Yabchik, but they're doing they great do. job. They just, they're incredible at doing. Yeah. Yeah. And the Chesed, I mean. It's unreal. They, they're literally people waiting on the corner to do Chesed. There's a reason why every great therapist out there in our community, more than half of their clientele are Hasidim. Because, like, it's it's only the best, like exactly what you're saying. Like it's we're gonna do this, and if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it well, and and they do in virtually every regard. And it's uh, I, I can't tell you the honor of, of being there. Um, I learned so much from them on a regular basis. It's a, you're, it's also like you're a trailblazer by by doing such a thing, you know, being the director of such a clinic there, yeah. and um, hopefully you're helping contribute to a just a healthy generation. 
Yeah, we're doing uh, we're doing a lot. Of what we're doing in just our little clinic, and again, it's not so little anymore. Um, but we have a. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Kalma Vassar. Yeah, it's like yeah, that's it's like, like a hotline. Yeah, it's like it's, but like it's a lot more than a hotline. It's like a, ESPN in the Jew, in the Hasidic world. Yeah, every every person in the enough Hasidic sport, community enough, not, <laughs> enough sports references. Not here. <laughs> no, but every person in the Hasidic community knows their number by heart. Yeah, um, I get calls from them sometimes, like a big like screaming Yiddish announcement and I have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I thought I like, hit someone's car and he's calling me like, I don't yes, know. I, I have a segment on Kalma Vassar in English <laughs> wow. talking about mental health. Wow. And it's just, it's just, it's just so much fun. Um, There's a practical tip. Nachi totally calling in tonight. Yeah. What's the number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know the number, um, but it's, uh, it's just wonderful to be a part of something like that. That's and really awesome. Yeah. Zooming out of Williamsburg for a moment, and inclusive yeah. of, of the Hasidish community, we talked a little bit about the, the pain that people encounter and the value of being in therapy and getting vulnerable with whatever a person might be struggling with or trauma or abuse. Yeah. And COVID, you mentioned, exacerbated all of these issues. Let's shift for a moment to someone who might not have encountered any of those dramatic experiences. Um, we talked a little bit on a previous episode with Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson about epigenetics, how Love it. our nation, <clears throat> you know, we bequeath the, the trauma multi intergenerationally and we're sort of carrying a lot of the trauma from our ancestors. And, you know, there's a lot of studies and research that, that has demonstrated this and that's super, you know, fascinating. Yeah. But there's also people that just struggle with day-to-day -day anxieties and they have no trauma to point to and maybe they don't have you know, ancestors that survived the Holocaust, but they're just struggling today. What, what can we tell our brothers and sisters in that, in that category? Well, again, I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of the word trauma nowadays only what, because what it's... What I, I, I try my best to avoid the word altogether only because... It's so grossly overused at this point, you know, like breaking a fingernail is, is yeah. referred to as trauma. I was reading some paper recently and whatever, whatever the case was, was some more social media stuff. Um, but someone was like referring to, you know, losing a case as now I'm going to be traumatized for the rest of my life. Yeah. And it's just, it's just this mass term. Um, and to me, to me, when you sit with people who've suffered so much in their lives, like there are certain people that deserve that title mm -hmm. and it's not fair to just make it universal for everyone. Yeah, it's like addiction as well. Um, like people get calls all the time from, especially when I was dealing a lot more with addiction than I am today, you know, Bahram struggling in yeshiva with just their, their humanity and, and their sexuality, let's call it that. And, and I'm a shkia, will call and say, oh, this boy is a, is a, he's addicted to whatever his struggles might be. Um, and then when you start reviewing it and you start listening to the story, you're like, he's not addicted. He's, he's a boy. He's a young man. He's trying to figure himself out. And, and let's save the term addiction for someone who's lost their family. They've lost their job. They're down on everything and they're completely lost. So it's an, it's an actual like diagnosis. Yeah. It's a real thing. You can't just say like people, people use it in terms of like, oh, I'm addicted to caffeine. I'm addicted to shopping. I'm addicted. But those are, those are actual yeah, categories, and, you and I see the same thing with trauma. Like, like trauma is something that that many people live with. And when you sit with a person who has completely lost their sense of self and identity, and lost all forms of hope, and the only thing that they see in the present and in the future and in the past is just darkness. Like to me, that's it's it's sacred, and we need to honor that. Um, and but at the same time, humanity is not a simple thing. Being alive is not a simple thing. Engaging in relationships aren't simple. Um, trying to survive in the world that we've created for ourselves is pretty nuts. The demand that we've placed upon ourselves is crazy. Your average, your average from Jew, in order to simply survive, I'm not talking about thrive and make it and be the most successful person in the world, needs to exist in like the 0.1% of the highest achievers of the world ever. And that's the world that we've created for ourselves. Wow. And to, to imagine a person not experiencing doubt or anxiety or fear. So, are you saying that the, the Orthodox world, that life is more prone to anxiety? I think there are parts of it that are 
significantly more challenging than and based you find on that, in other areas. Yeah, and based but, on what you just said, it's like, it's got to be. However, it's balanced out by the fact that we have a Shem in our lives. Boom. You know, and uh, you have you have the struggle. Set that up. Yeah, but you also, I don't know if that was deliberate or not, but we also have, we have <laughs> the we other side. Yesterday. We're talking about <laughs> <laughs> We also have the other side. And the other sure. side is Hashem is with us. And Hashem is always with us. And there's, this is the most beautiful nation in the world. What we have is yeah. is so dear and so special. And yes, we've, we've created an environment where we have to operate on the highest level possible. And imagine, imagine what it's like if you're just like an average from Jew and you don't have the particular talent for whatever reason to make $500,000 a year. Like, yeah. and you're, but you're a good guy and you're working really hard and you're doing really well. You feel like a failure. And we've created that for ourselves. It's tough. Like you're needing to ask for handouts. You're needing to like present your tax returns so your kids could go to yeshiva. The, the embarrassment of that and the shame of that is not mm. simple. Um, but yet, so we have a shame. solution oriented, not just identifying the issue. Yeah. What, what, do we tell that, what do we tell that person? Get in the cash advance. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, with, go with the cash advance. I like that advice. Uh, yeah, but then you have to grapple with some other things. Yeah, it probably um, comes with a little more problem. Yeah, it's not so simple. Sponsored by Capital Funding. No. I, I, again, I think if we money. create if we successfully create a world uh, internally where it's not, it's not hierarchical the way we've set it up, where there's such a clear standard of this person's on top and this person's successful. And again, when you look at the research, when you ask these people, do you feel successful? Do you feel happier? The answer is no. It's mm -hmm. not they're still dealing with the humanity that everyone else is dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, if we create a, a vulnerable enough environment, a person could hopefully be okay enough with who they are. And be enough with that. I went into my profession with no intention ever. I was dating, I remember I was dating this, this, this woman at the time. And I said, I'm, I'm becoming a social worker. At the time, I didn't have my doctorate. And, and I, I wasn't a person who, who could demand a great deal of money when I'm doing my work or lecturing or things of that sort. And I said, I, I, I need to partner with a person because I'm not going to be able to support a family on my own. Like, I needed to say that when I was dating. There was no intention of being vulnerable. able to do it. It was really vulnerable. And there was this one person who said, like, listen, I can't. That's not something I could do. And one of the greatest gifts my wife gave me, even though she's as driven as ever and does the most beautiful work and is very, very successful in everything she does, was, I'm here with you. We'll do this together. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you didn't need to feel that success. What you needed to feel was, it's okay to be you. Yeah. And you have other values. You have other things that you offer even if it's your work ethic, even if it's your desire, that's good. And well, how about we start evaluating people in that way yeah. as opposed to the numerical value that's behind their name? I love that reframe just of the term success. Yeah. Right? The default when you ask, when someone states, oh, he or she's super successful at yeah. what? Right. Yeah. At successful what? Successful at what? Success to me, you were talking about this before, like if you could be present in your life and you could actually live in the Tuesday that you're living in, like, that's pretty successful to me. I look up to those people there's, there's, the most. Yeah, there's no amount of money I wouldn't pay to just be able to be mindful every single day and to be present every single day. Yeah. Because we're not. Out it's we're for not, free, by the way. We're not, we're not in it's control. Like air, you know? it's we free. don't know. We're it's a, all. There's a Rebbe line right there. You know? We're all planning <laughs> for something that we don't even know will ever come to be. It's the craziest thing. What Think is this now? world? <laughs> You're getting me very meta. <laughs> no, it's really wild. Where Think about we? what we've done. Think about what we've done to ourselves. Like, it's not a world that Man -made is at all conducive to the moment. We do not live present. But I was doing a little research recently. When you look at some of the tribes living in, in like, some, the, the jungles of Africa, the average working man is spending around five to seven hours a week working. That's what he does. A week. A week. That's what he does. Mm. And those five to seven hours are about get, making sure his family has food, building shelter, and making sure he's involved in communal stuff. And can you imagine what the rest of the week looks like? When's the last time we just sat with friends? I think there's a lot of research about a four-day work week. There's, there's a lot of talk about it recently. Right? Yeah, yeah. But only very few companies actually adopt it. Well, what's generally it's a five-day work week? Yeah. yeah could you be honest? Friday. How many of us would embrace that? To be like, really, like how many of us would really embrace that? I mentioned my business partner earlier in the episode. <laughs> I'm going to have to speak to him first. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think most of us would reject you know, it because we, we, at this point, we need to produce on the highest level in order to feel adequate. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, then we yeah. feel like we're falling behind and everyone else is surpassing us. 
Um, but the research is astonishing because they're measuring the re- productivity. What's the research? The research more productive? is that a four week, a four day work week is as or more productive than a five day work week. Yeah, I read about Rob Mayer's Lotowitz that he is that saw that he that they did not work on Friday in his office in Art Scroll, and they were building something huge. Mm-hmm. So when I started this organization, and thank God now I have around five employees, I it's one of the things I adopted right away is is like Friday's just not you know. We're, we're a Jewish organization and we work on spreading Torah and creating content. Like take the Friday to prepare for Shabbos. Mm-hmm. I really try to um, implement that, but it's not even from the productivity angle, but that's very interesting to know. Yeah. Why are we not being more productive guys? <laughs> like, what's going on? Yeah. We're, yeah. we're going to start working I did. I, I had the Friday other and th- Sunday. <laughs> yeah. The other week, <laughs> the other week I was just, I, had, I literally was burnt out. I couldn't, I just, I was overworked and, and, I wasn't nourished enough myself, and I literally just took two days and just spent spent those time spent the time in the forest. Basically, I spoke to us. I rented an Airbnb on a lake and get out of here. That's it. I was just there. Where in New York? Uh, in Pennsylvania. I rented it. I rented a little little hut on See, the. See, that's so the awesome. Water. That's so awesome. It was so great. It was so wonderful for two days. Just two days. That's sick. Just, just there by phone? myself. <laughs> you brought your phone. No, my, I brought my phone, but I turned it off. I had it. I told. What good is it I if mean, it's off? <laughs> well, I, I basically turned it off. My wife knew yeah. she could reach me if she called me two times in a row, and then it would go through. Right, right. Um, oh, but the, aside the from that, there was no phone. It was just, it was just the silence and myself and Hashem, and it was very special. That's awesome. I've heard. Uh, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this. I've heard that there's value instead of getting to that burnout stage. And then taking that vacation, but actually building in that self care into the routine, right? Yeah. To avoid getting to that burnout and then needing those couple of days. Yeah. Well, I, I'll. It's interesting that you know we talk a lot about balance, and I've realized I've spoken to people who are. I'm a very passionate human being. Like I, I have like real desires to, to bring some love into the world as best as I possibly can, and I don't think you could do that with taking too much time by yourself. Um, and what I, I sort of reframed it as like, if you're really, really passionate, you're not going to be a balanced human being. And I don't think I'm a very balanced person. Um, but I, I give it my all, um, as much as I possibly can, but then I provide myself with treats, um, just to allow myself to keep going. We're going away next week as a family. We're going to Arizona, spend some time. Shavuos was beautiful. Some time in the forest, some time away with my wife. Um, you know, how important is that? How important is that for the average young couple slash family? You know, to just do that. It's stuff? very interesting that I, I've spoken to therapists about this, and I'm not sure if they're the right people to speak to about this. But mo- many therapists have a hard time with that idea of like, you know, e- either one of two things. I'm uh, for me, my, I, I nourish myself by snowboarding. Like to me, I you're so cool. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> like, like right before I nourish myself by like Lay's potato chips, and <laughs> you're going snowboarding. I'm going no. I literally there. I've had days where I'm driving to work, and I'm like, this is not going to happen. I turn around, get my board, hit a mountain, and I'm just on the mountain so all day. Only if you're present can you do. Can you do like honestly? Like I'm driving to work, and I don't even realize I'm in my car. Like right. only. Only how far is your commute? Like, I'm just curious. <laughs> how long no. do you have to think about it? You no, know, it, no. But sometimes you just know, like, I just can't do this. I, I need to. But the, the, to have that self-awareness to be able to make a decision of like, well, I'm going to choose something. Well, sometimes you have to choose that thing. What is it? I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, mean, I think if you're living You have with to, yourself, but to have the courage to actually choose it. Right. Well, I I think we have we have to honor the fact that we're we need things for ourselves and I for some reason I can't explain it why ever since I'm a little kid it's always like living on the edge it started out I can't even talk about rollerblading anymore because I'm gonna date myself uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but like rollerblading like holding on to cars at 50 miles an hour like that was just a normal thing and stunt parks and then we're glad you're alive you know? thank God we're <laughs> we're still here shout out to the Feigenbaum family in North Woodmere they brought back rollerblading oh, really nice. saw the whole family rollerblading down the block it was awesome oh that's it's, great. I think this is the second the second shout out for the Feigenbaum family um no you're uh, thinking pre- about the Blumenfrucht Blumen, okay, that's two for Blumenfrucht yeah. one for Feigenbaum yeah <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you got to You got it. One of the big deb- I'll get back to that question. But one one of the big debates that people have is: Is it okay for like one spouse to go away without the other? 
Mm. Um, and I think that that most therapists are divided on that. Most people are like, "That's not a good idea." Really? Yeah. And and many say it's a wonderful idea. You know, I'm a, I'm a I, I happen to think that. What do you think? Yeah. Well, when I when I first got married, I didn't have the ability or the courage to say, like, <laughs> I need yeah. I need to go snowboarding, and my wife doesn't like snowboarding. And I didn't know what to do. And I felt like there was a part of me that was just dying. Mm, I needed wow. to hit that mountain. And I needed to go as fast as I possibly could. And you need not, to shred, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> I just needed to. And then finally, like, I, I built that card. I said, listen, I just, I got I to gotta go to the mountain. And she was like, okay, go. And it was, <laughs> it was just so wonderful. And, and I, I'd say almost every, every year, the last maybe 15 years, I'll, I'll go head out west somewhere, often by myself. Um, I'll just, I'll take my board, you know, get on a plane and just board for three days and come home. Mama, what would you do if like, like, I don't know if you've ever been in that scenario, but what is that thing if you have permission to do that you do that, that you think you need more of? I think meditation is something that I need more permission to do and to just stop and to shut my phone and to not be on top of everything that's happening in my life and not to be immediately available to every single one of the various responsibilities that I carry and to always be responsive immediately, whether it's to a friend or a client or an employee or just to always be on, on, on. Right. And I need more permission to just be by myself or with my wife or with my kids and to just let go for yeah. a little bit of all the responsibility that's pulling at my bandwidth. Yeah, snowboarding yeah. is a little cooler. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the same thing. I'm yeah. really might be smart honest. snowboarding while that's yeah, happening. It's yeah, exactly no, right. what's happening. Half the time when I'm snowboarding, I'll stop middle of the mountain and just look at the glorious world Hashem gave us and said, yeah. like, like, let's just take this in. It's interesting. I think I, I think it's uh, it's like I think I enjoy the outdoors more than I th like I think. Because when I when I go upstate, not that anyone asks me, you know. <laughs> <but> <laughs> yeah, good question, Afi. Um, <laughs> I think like when how I, about you though, <laughs> right? I just asked myself a question in my head and didn't even tell you guys. It was wonderful, uh, right? It was a rare um, thing to do. Yeah, I gave my permission to do. It. I gave myself permission. You know, that was good. <laughs> well done. I, I think like because when I go upstate and I just like my brother in law has a farm up there, like animals and stuff like that. It's just like I I walk away from that a little refreshed. And I I spent 15 years in camp, like Camp Monk, and. Obviously, after you get married, you don't have camp anymore. Yeah. Well, like, what are you doing this summer? I'm doing what they do in February. <laughs> you know, I'm working, you know, like maybe get to go out a little more. But I think, I, you know, after after I stopped going to camp and I went to camp up until I got engaged, like a few days after camp, you wow. know, but just that I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the upstate. It's it's just like that bubble that used to exist away from city life, away from the all the noise and the constant you know i wonder if there's a way to replicate that without actually having to go to camp again because i promised my wife ain't going to camp like she's not she's not <laughs> there's doing no it. more camp there's no more camp you I, know? I think it's where we belong to be really honest you have to remember this this whole thing is very new what Every, like this whole Central civilization <laughs> civilization and big buildings and and homes you know, we lived in nature forever. That's just the way we were kind of made. And I, th I just don't think that's happening again. No, like, I don't think we're going back to that. Go glamping, Nachi. Go glamping. Yeah. What's glamping? Glamping is like glamorous camping. Yeah. For people that are. So like I saw like this Airbnb that's like a, it's like this beautiful tent, but like it's not a tent. It's like see-through glass. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's don't forget glamping. that Airbnb did not pay for this. We're not going to discuss yeah. it. You know, but yeah, it's, it's, listen, it's not an easy thing to do. We're all in this race. We're all trying to figure it out. We're all trying to do the best we possibly yeah. can, you know, but we just need to remind ourselves every once in a while that like, I, I don't know anyone who's not trying their best in any context. I don't know anyone who's not inherently internally as beautiful as they could possibly be, but we just tend to not remind ourselves of that enough. Yeah. And we, we move in other directions and we focus on the struggles and, and they're there. They're very real. And again, the greatest honor in the world to sit with people in that place. I, there's no other place in the world I'd rather be than in like the place of darkness with people. Because cause I know that when I'm there with them, there's at least they have company. You know, at least they're not alone in that moment. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but just to remind ourselves every once in a while that we're just 
we're beautiful and we're trying. And, and if we need that, if we need a little time, then let's find a way to take it, even if it's for a minute, a little bit, even to say it to ourselves every once in a while. You know, and, and I think we talk about all these big, like, cliches, like we're going to turn off our phone and mm -hmm. we're going to shut the whole thing down. We live in a world where we need to respond most of the time. But there's still ways, I imagine, yeah. you know, when Someone we take a walk. Me. Someone challenged me yesterday. I was expressing that I was overwhelmed by something. And he said, I was not home. And he challenged me. He said, before you drive into your driveway, just stop. He said, five minutes. That's a long time. Just stop before you get into the driveway and just don't do anything for five minutes. Mm. Don't listen to anything. Don't think about anything. Oh. Just stop. Five minutes. What was that like? Were you able to do it? I was. Really? Uh, I accepted the challenge I and I did it. it I don't know if wild. I would do that. It, it, isn't it crazy that... Five minutes like, Even like when year. I think about that, that's like... Gives you anxiety? Lot, like, what are you going to do? <laughs> You're gonna, are you going to listen to something or is there something on in the background? Some form of music that you like? It's like even common, like, headspace to have, like, these exercises nowadays where it's do nothing for 30 seconds. And I found that to be so funny because especially, like, in, in the Orthodox world, the firm world, like, I what I kind of got into five years ago was taking short amounts of time that we have and infusing with Torah, you know, meaningful minute, you know, short increments, trying to, you know, just fight for those minutes here and there. And I think I've, I've been seeing more than ever, just even my platform, the, the, the consensus of just like, if you have a minute in your day or 30 seconds in your day to just do something, sometimes you should do nothing. Cause like you'll be able to sit with yourself you know, I think like that's what Lubavitcher Rebbe was a big, a big um, proponent, proponent advocate of having the moment of silence in classrooms around America and public schools and all in all schools, just having the students to be able to start their day and just have a moment of silence of reflection, and um, you know maybe I don't know maybe if that existed nowadays in the schools maybe maybe our, our like the world that we live in where these crazy things happens, maybe less of that would happen if people could hatch, actually have honest reflection yeah. of, what, of what's going on. a crazy going. challenge for us right now. What? 30 seconds right now. Not say anything. Let I'm anyone ready, that's man. listening to this, put the drink down. Stop for 30 <laughs> seconds. Oh, I was moving it. So I have to be more present. Something. Something. 30 seconds? Okay. Who's going to tell us when it's 30 seconds? I'll tell you. Yeah? But then I'm doing something. Shalom, you got us? Okay. Can't do it. I'm, I'm not doing anything, man. Yeah, people thought the podcast ended. <laughs> <laughs> people walked For away. For anyone that's still so here, no. how are you, though? Someone's yeah. like, well, some missile hit that office because <laughs> I was listening and then it just went quiet. Can I advocate a little bit for tefillah with this, with this idea? Yeah. Meaning when you think about like literally three times a day having this opportunity to just be with yourself and with Hashem and, and even just to be with yourself also. If let's say you're not on that place where you feel like you're communicating, even communicating with yourself, just what matters to me, what is important. It's a great, this is so Halic. By Whoever's the way. watching, you're like wondering what happened the last three minutes of the episode. Like, why is he much higher up now? <laughs> like, look what at happened? that thing. Anyways, I think, no, I think like this is a good place to, to wrap it up. Because um, honestly, no, was we, in the middle of a, Oh, you were? Uh, yeah. Oh, go for no, it. I was tefillah. Just no, tefillah. I was just talking about tefillah. Like, yeah. like we, we literally have it like set up in our lives and our schedule. Like pause. I just want to tell you one story. It was yeah. a, a pivotal moment in my life, and I was maybe eighteen at the time, struggling a lot with Yiddishkeit, but trying to find my way back in a way that like made sense to me. And I'm learning with my brother in Baltimore, and we noticed in the shul, just some random shul, we noticed that there was like a group of people walking in and out of a room. And turns out there was a makubel there. I, to this day, I don't know his name. Um, he only spoke Hebrew, I only spoke English, and I said, okay, let me go in. And I ended up spending like four to five hours there with him, and he literally told everyone else to leave, and we had a very hard time communicating with one another. But you know, every once in a while when you, you have like a soul connection with another person, like yeah. language is cheap in that moment, mm -hmm. and we communicated on this really deep level. And we were talking about connection and presence and tshuva and what does it mean to return 
And what, what do you then do with the things that you, you dishonored yourself in the past? And how do you begin to live with some of those elements? And he shared a beautiful idea with me that, that is forever present. It's, and it's with me in virtually every tefillah that I have ever since. And I, I wish I knew who this man was so I could thank him in person. I just don't. I don't know who he is. He's just like a malach. He was sent to me. And he shared this idea about the Beis HaMikdash. He said, how, does, how exactly, what was the function of a carbon? How is it possible that you have, you do something physical, you have a physical severing of your relationship with Hashem, and it's, it's a spiritual quality, and you're, you're distancing yourself from Hashem. And then you go and bring a carbon, which is this physical product, this animal, you shecht it, and somehow that's making a difference in your life. He said, even if you look at it as a spiritual uh, experience, like how does that work? How is something physical repairing something that's like a spiritual severing of a relationship? Right. And he said that, that what we often lose sight of is the fact that when you brought a carbon, you had the levium in the background singing. And he said, really it was that, like the singing and the moment and the reflection, it brought you to a deeper presence with yourself. Mm. And he said, when you daven, like it's an opportunity for you to sing a new song. And, and it's something that, like, when we bring ourselves into that space, like, wh- wherever we are, and we always have different feelings when we daven, if we take that opportunity to say, like, how am I feeling, and how can that express itself in some form of tune? Like, to me, like, practicing that literally three times a day for the last 20-something years of my life, where there's always a song, in certain parts of my tefillah where it's a song, and sometimes those songs are broken, and sometimes they're filled with hope, and sometimes they're filled with gratitude, but they're always something a little bit different. I imagine my children would be able to tell the mood I'm in if they just daven next to me. And sometimes I've been called out on that. Like, what was that all about? Mm. And I'm like, it's just a rough day, man. I'm just... That's have, awesome, you know. Man. That's really awesome. And it, just that idea, it's built in. It's like designed for us to sit and, and be with ourselves and, and also be with Hashem. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful way to live um, so long as we permit it. That's amazing. You know, I find it something that I was thinking about, which is really random, is that we went an hour and a half, and I didn't say your name once. Like, I didn't say Dr. Akiva Perlman once. Uh, like Dr. Akiva Perlman, everybody. <laughs> like, welcome to the show. Let's start over. Um, no, but really, thank, thank you. you so thank much. you so much. That was that was amazing. That was really thank amazing. And, I, and bracha to all of us that, besides for you, because you already got it, but that we should be able to implement these things into our lives. So much wisdom. But the listeners, you know, I don't mean to disagree. Don't exclude with him from you. the bracha, dude. I don't. I don't mean to disagree with you. I think you could disagree with to, me. to be to be with ourselves is constant work. That we don't arrive. Right. The moment we arrive, there's no real need for us to be present here. Like we're always working on a a way of perfecting ourselves, and mm-hmm. and that that quality is with all of us. There's no there's no one who's ahead in that game. Yeah, we're in different planes, but everyone's everyone's doing the same work. And that's what I love about like the shared human experience. There's just so much more that connects us than separates us. And once we tap into our deep sense of humanity, I think we could virtually connect to everybody because we all know what it's like to be sad. We know what it's like to be happy. And we know what it's like to be hopeful. And we just connect with those ideas and we bring ourselves into that space with others and we get to share it with people. And that's the greatest gift we could live with. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. It's a Thank great you. honor. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. It was so meta. That was free therapy. That was so just halic. like, I was just like chill. It was so chill. Halic. You can't be nervous sitting with, with, a, with a guy like that. Dr. Perlman, what an experience. What an experience. There's so many things that he said that I loved that I want to implement. What do you think? Yeah. No, really. Just inviting quiet time on a daily basis, not waiting for the crisis. Just on a daily doing that self-care, that self-love, taking care of your inner child yeah because you're sure it's true i really hope you enjoyed this episode if you did make sure to leave five star review uh five star rating leave a review we'd love to hear from you meaningful people podcast at gmail.com and of course guys you can now head to meaningfulminute.org you go watch and listen to these episodes there we also have new articles being uploaded every single week behind the scenes content so go ahead to, go ahead and go go ahead and head to meaningfulminute.org go ahead and head go ahead ahead Go ahead and Uh-oh. head. Go. What did you just start? I don't know. Guys, it's way too late for us to be still doing this. Anyways, we'll this be is still on the root canal day. I'm oh struggling. My gosh. Still the root canal day. We'll be back with another episode at you next week. So uh, until then, stay safe. Thank you so much. Seriously. Adios.